Thanks, Lance, and uh, good day, everyone. Glad to have everyone with us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about a very interesting case study of how an electric utility was able to deliver very cost-effective internet backhaul uh, for a lot of its uh, constituents. And of course, our special guest for that is uh, is David Van Winkle from from Georgia Transmission. So, David, thank you for for being here. Like Lance said. Um, I'll make a couple quick introductory comments and then we'll turn it over to David to talk about uh, what they did and why they did it. But before that, um, you know, this is really an interesting time in our in our world right now, kind of kind of post-COVID, and I don't think the time has ever been better uh, for people to provide uh, solutions for high-speed rural internet services. There's just a tremendous need, even post-COVID, uh, I think people are a little bit surprised maybe about how the work from home um, mode is kind of continuing. Uh, and people have learned to rely on uh, the internet for telemedicine in many cases. I don't think that's going to diminish very much. Uh, continued need for remote education. And actually, uh, you know, a bunch of more teenagers still exist who enjoy cloud gaming. So there's just this tremendous need. And also I think there's an increasing recognition that the digital divide that has sort of plagued our country is uh, is no longer really quite as tolerable as it used to be. I come from a very small town myself in, in Iowa, and there's a lot of very smart, hardworking people back home, and giving people like that uh, all over the country access to high-speed internet, uh, the country as a whole is just much better off. And I think people are really starting to realize that. Um, fortunately, there's just a ton of new enablers. Uh, a lot of these are sort of regulatory, uh, uh, kinds of things. There's the RDOF uh, funding that most folks are aware of, $20 billion there. There's going to be another fund created by the FCC that uh, not everyone is quite aware of. It's called the 5G Fund for Rural America. There's another $9 billion uh, that the government is, is making available. Of course, there were huge uh, participation in the recent CBRS auction. A lot of that uh, CBRS spectrum will be used for broadband access for residential customers number of state uh, initiatives have happened and the Emergency Broadband Act. So the need is really meeting the enablers right now. When most people think about delivering rural broadband, a lot of the focus, understandably, it tends to be um, a sort of on the access portion of the network. But there's a, you know, in the old days, it was a DSL, a DSLAM kind of system. Now it's more of like a PLAN system. So a lot of folks have, have been focused on uh, you know, digging fiber, putting fiber in that last mile, uh, getting the pawn equipment, let's call it up and running. And the next area of focus where people are starting to look at that is called what I would call the backbone or the backhaul portion of the network. Uh, basically the job of the backbone or the backhaul network is to connect those access networks uh, to the internet and whatever applications that people want to hit. Uh, several important characteristics of that backhaul network, and you'll hear David talk about these things in this section. Uh, just the ability of that backbone to be able to scale. Um, it's not good enough anymore to have 10 megabit internet. People need 100 meg, 200 meg, 500 meg kinds of internet connections. That backbone has to be able to scale along with it, and it also has to be able to scale in terms of distance as uh, as we're reaching more and more rural people with uh, with internet access, that internet pop may be quite a distance away. You need to have amplification and the ability to achieve distance. Security is important on these networks, and of course, reliability and protection is going to be very important on that backhaul network. So some things you'll hear uh, more about when David talks. And then finally, um, David is just one example, uh, Georgia Transmission is just one example of the electric utilities and how they're getting involved in this whole game. Um, electric utilities, uh, of course, telcos are getting involved as well, but electric, electric utilities have some interesting uh, interesting advantages. They have a very significant right-of-way in many cases. Their, their power lines kind of go everywhere, they give, and lots of times there's uh, fiber uh, on those power lines already. Uh, so they have a great work right-of-way advantage. Uh, they're also very good at handling billing and customer service for a large number of customers. That suits them well for delivering internet services. And finally, utilities are very good at delivering services that can't go down. So, uh, you know, the internet is one of those services and they can provide a utility grade uh, internet service. And there's lots of uh, examples of folks getting involved in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama. There were a number of state initiatives that uh, legalized uh, electric co-ops getting into the residential broadband game. 
uh, a lot of activity in particular I've noted going on in the state of Mississippi, but it's not just in the southeast, it's kind of everywhere. And interesting partnerships are being formed, partnerships between investor-owned utilities and electric co-ops in some cases, uh, and also partnerships between telcos and utilities where maybe they're swapping fiber or they're having other kinds of business arrangements. So there's just lots of activity in this area and, uh, and the time is really right for this. So with that intro, uh, well David, I guess I'll turn it over to you and uh, let me know when you need me to advance the slide for you. All right, you can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so, you know, what I kind of want to do is kind of explain who we are, Georgia Transmission Corporation, and talk a little bit about how we went about building our fiber network, um, why we built it, and then how we built it, uh, what the design is, uh, and what the benefits we're seeing, and, and finally, you know, uh, rural broadband and, and broadband initiatives, how we're going to be able to support our members with this network. So, next slide. So Georgia Transmission is a not-for-profit electric membership cooperative uh, that's owned by 38 of the 41 EMCs in the state. There's three that are our TBA co-ops. Uh, but we plan, build, maintain transmission assets for our members. Uh, we have about 3,400 miles of transmission line, about 752 substations, and that's both transmission class facilities and distribution substations. We do have about another 100 substations that we don't own that EMCs take service from in Georgia. Uh, we have about 2.7 billion in assets and about 300 employees. So next slide. Uh, this is just a map of all the EMCs in the state. And as you can see, we cover most of the land area, about 73%. We serve about 4 million residential customers. The EMCs actually are the largest uh, electric provider to residential customers in the state. Uh, we are about 35% the EMCs are of the overall load in Georgia with a peak load of about 9,300 megawatts. Next slide. Uh, so telecommunications, we've been in telecommunications for quite a while. Uh, in the late 1980s, early 90s, we started installing RTUs and metering at all of our distribution and transmission substations. Unfortunately, the only communications you had at that time were the point-to-point uh, -point copper wire circuits. Uh, so uh, we, we used those for about 10 to 12 years, and then upgraded to Frame Relay. And Frame Relay was really nice because uh, it was routable. So we not only, we could use it for ourselves, but we could also allow our, our uh, members to use the same circuit and then just route it to their headquarters. And we the Frame went along for about 10, 12 years, and then AT&T approached us and said they were killing their Frame Relay network, and we had to move to the next generation. So in 2012, we, we started a uh, multi-protocol label switching MPLS network, which is not true MPLS. We also, it's a slash Ethernet as well. A lot of our circuits are, are Ethernet circuits. But I think the important thing to see is every time we change, we increased our capacity because of all the electronics, the cameras going out in the substations, and we don't see that trend stopping. We're always going to need additional capacity at those sites. Next slide. Um, so turning point. So why did we decide to go out and build our own fiber network? Well, for me, this was one of the big ones. Uh, and I'm actually over the storm center at uh, Georgia Transmission as well. So February of 2014, uh, I think everybody saw it on the national news. I have a brother who lives in Switzerland who saw it on international news of just the uh, traffic jams in Atlanta because of an ice storm that then turned into a snowstorm and all the big uh, semis jackknifed and just shut the, the whole city down. The, I put a picture of the traffic map uh, from that day. That's red, but it actually went all black, which I didn't even know black was a, uh, a traffic color. But uh, in the middle of all that, while we're watching, fortunately we had no electrical outages during, the, uh, during that event. But we did lose communications to one of our 500 KV substations that's in the ring around Atlanta. And if you lose communications, you have to man that substation. So we managed to get a uh, technician to the station. He, he uh, verified that everything was okay inside the station and the problem was AT&T. And, and you'll see the comment there that I uh, put in red, I bolded, I underlined because I truly remember this statement. 
sir, we don't work in this kind of weather when we called them to get them to come out to the station. And, and they didn't. They refused to send anyone out. So we actually had to send a cot to the guy so he could sleep in the station. And since then, we have actually installed fiber because we don't want to go back to that. So next slide. Hey, David, if I can interrupt for just a second. Um, you know, I grew yeah. up up north, and I was looking at that picture of the traffic jam and the snow. And, and, and to a northerner like me, that doesn't look like a lot of snow. But uh, I used to live in Atlanta, and I realized that's a, that's a catastrophe, right? Well, that's ice underneath, and that's really what caused the problems. It wasn't the snow, it was the ice. So. Yeah, that's a, it's a bad situation. Um, yeah. So we, we got together afterwards and we said, if we're going to do our own network, you know, why are we doing it and what do we want out of it? And, and I will tell you, the primary purpose of our network is for internal operations of Georgia Transmission and our members. Uh, but we knew that as we were building this, there was the opportunity for secondary purpose, which is, you know, community development, rural broadband. Uh, but, you know, the communications, we've we got to have reliability. We, it's got to be available when we need it. You know, I, I don't need it when the sky is blue. I really need it when, when we got problems on our, on our network, which is normally storms. Uh, we needed our capacity. So if I put cameras out of the station, I'd be able to uh, allocate more capacity so I could turn the cameras on and monitor them. Uh, security, you know, cybersecurity is a huge issue in, in the uh, utility industry, and we're under the SIP rules. So having more control over how we encrypt and how we secure our telecommunications was important. And then last, control. I mean, instead of AT&T coming to me saying they wanted to change, we wanted the ability to say, well, no, we want to change quicker, or no, this is working and we don't have to. So those are some of the, some of the issues that we looked at. So next slide. So this is what our network looks like today. So from basically seven years down the road, um, you'll see the stars in the map. Those are actually EMC headquarters. And that was our first goal. Originally, our, our, our previous CEO said, I want to get to every substation as your, as your goal. And I said, well, that's going to be a lot tougher. I don't have paths to all stations, but what, why don't we shoot for the EMC headquarters? And so we got the last one turned up uh, this time last year. So it took about six years to get this all together. Uh, you'll notice that you know we're trying to build rings uh, on, the, on, our, on our statewide network. Obviously, we've got some that aren't rings. So this is going to be a, a network that we're, we're going to continue to work on you know, into the future. This is not the final form, but at least we got our first big goal, which was to get the EMCs connected as far as headquarters. All right, next slide. And a lot of that looks like it was over sort of the existing fiber that you already have. Is that, is that correct, David? Well, uh, should, next slide, we all got kind of explain how we built the network. So, you know, the first the first thing we did, obviously, is we, we do have our own transmission lines and our own right-of-ways. So we installed about 600 route miles of fiber. A lot of it was OPGW in the shield wire uh, of, the tra of the transmission lines, but we did do some that was underground uh, along the edge of the right-of-way. And then we took that fiber and leveraged it to um, be able to swap for fiber with telephone companies and small fiber companies in the state. So we swapped for about uh, a little over 1,000 miles of fiber. And then there were just some areas where we had no assets, we had no right-of-ways, there was no fiber that anyone was interested in swapping. So we ended up leasing uh, the dark fiber. Um, about 1,100 route miles. Normally those are the longer runs between uh, like Atlanta to Jacksonville or Atlanta to Chattanooga, we uh, leased a lot of that fiber. I did put the average cost down there. Right now, we're probably about $7 a fiber mile per month. And what we found is the longer routes were fairly cheap. I think the lowest we paid was just about $4 a fiber mile per month for Atlanta to Jacksonville route. Unfortunately, that company went bankrupt shortly thereafter. And we were told by the other company that, that bought them, that you'll never get that rate again. Uh, but on the high side, you know, for short uh, rural routes where there's no other fiber available, uh, you're, I would think of the most we paid is $35 a fiber mile per month. And, and it's really what the market will bear. You, you can't go to the Wall Street Journal to look for fiber prices. It's really just what you can uh, negotiate. Next slide. So this is just a graphic of what are the numbers I just uh, told you. Moving forward, I think the, the build is going to get increase 
pretty dramatically. And what we're hoping is over time, the, the least fiber will we'll be able to uh, drop off a lot of that and have our own fiber that we control. Next slide. And so this is the design. So for the least and the swap fiber, we don't have 144 count fiber tables running along those routes. We only have four fibers. And we really, I kind of link it to the interstate highway system and the local roads. So for our DWDM express fiber pair, uh, we can only get off at the fiber hubs. We do not break that fiber uh, in between. The local fiber is what we use to go into the substations and into the EMC headquarters. Um, you know, initially we, we lit that at one gig because there wasn't that much traffic, but we are starting to have to go back and put some DWDM gear on, on the local uh, fiber as well. And right now we, on our express fiber, we, we started out at 10 gigabit per second and we are now adding cards because uh, the demand is increasing. And we, we, we think that's going to continue to happen. So we, we, we've got some 100 gigabit per second cards in as well to help provide backhaul to uh, the telco hotels in downtown Atlanta for internet uh, service. Next slide. So this is how we kind of picked ribbon. And it's probably pretty similar to what any uh, company would do is we, we sent out an RFP uh, we got the responses back from nine vendors. We eliminated all but two. Um, a lot of them could meet our requirements, and some of them were just really expensive. Uh, we then rated, ranked, weighted the responses after some in-person presentations, and we selected Ribbon. And I will say that my, my uh, uh, telecom staff has been very happy with that selection. That, that Ribbon's been a very good uh, uh, equipment selection for us. Uh, next slide. So um, the DWDM of gear that we installed is uh, it's designed for uh, 40 separate light waves, so up to 200 gigabits per second per wave. Um, we have the ability to encrypt the uh, traffic, which is actually for us really critical because we, we definitely want to encrypt our operational data, uh, even if it's on a separate light wave. We don't we don't want to leave that uh, clear. Uh, the other thing that we do like about DWDM is you do have a physical separation uh, in color. So we put our operational uh, traffic on one color and then we put any commodity internet on different colors to keep them separate. And then we did include the online uh, OTDR, optical time domain reflexometer, I think is what that means. But anyway, and if we have a problem, what that allows us to do is from our knock, we can figure out where the degradation is or where the break is so we don't have to send technicians to each of the huts to, to shoot the fiber. So it, it cuts out some, some of the time for restoration. Uh, next slide. So what are the benefits that we've seen? Uh, well, we've, you know, interconnect all of our EMC headquarters and a lot of the, their district offices uh, with gigabit bandwidth and we're providing each of the EMCs with uh, internet at their headquarters uh, for their internal use. And, and I will say when we first started this, uh, some of our EMCs were leasing T1 lines, 1.5 meg, and we're paying $1,000 a month for internet over that 1.5 meg circuit. So this has been, in, in some of the rural areas of the state, you know, this is probably the, the fastest uh, broadband in, in some of those areas. Uh, it's, it's definitely allowed us to reduce costs because being in the telco hotels in downtown Atlanta, you can buy commodity internet for pennies. It's really the transport is a lot of the, of the cost. So uh, that's one of the things that we think we can do for the EMCs if they're interested, uh, get them to downtown Atlanta and maybe aggregate our, our, our internet, our ISP uh, bandwidth. So maybe save some costs for the EMCs that are going into rural broadband. Uh, we created a private cloud of servers uh, at our basement in our IT uh, group here in Atlanta and allows the EMCs to uh, put their critical data, uh, store it in a, an off-site backup so that if anything ever did happen, at least uh, they have the data somewhere besides their office. 
And we also do provide transport for EMC radio networks uh, to go tower to tower. So next slide. So some of the additional benefits that uh, we think we see are, uh, you know, connecting the members together for operational synergy. Uh, we think, you know, some of the EMCs are starting to talk about, you know, how they can work together. You know, we do have some EMCs that do not have 24-7 dispatch. So having this amount of capacity, we may be able to throw their SCADA system over to an EMC that does have 24-hour dispatch. Uh, we're looking at uh, voice circuits in the future. We haven't gone there yet, uh, but maybe trying to do uh, SIP trunks uh, from downtown Atlanta to any of the EMCs that, that need them. And then uh, one of the things that really shocked me, because I, I, I wouldn't have thought this would have been the case, but a lot of the small fiber companies in Georgia have the same problem that our members have, is getting how do you get to downtown Atlanta? So when we installed DWDM, we were actually able to swap uh, a fiber, I mean, a, a, a light color, a bandwidth, for dark fiber. And we actually, one of the last EMCs we got connected, I think we swapped 30 miles of fiber for uh, a 10 gig circuit back to Atlanta. So that's, that's been another way we've been able to use DWDM to build out our network. All right, next slide. So I talked about reliability at the very beginning. Um, how do you measure that? Well, this is kind of how we do it. Uh, we have uh, the circuits and the number of trouble tickets there, and you can see about 40% of our network now is on fiber. And when you look at the trouble tickets, the call-outs that we have to do, only 4%. And this has been pretty consistent over the last couple of years. Uh, I know in, from 2018 to 2019, same time frame, we were very similar numbers. So yes, we, we feel like we are definitely getting much better reliability by going to fiber. Next, next slide. All right, uh, go into kind of some of the DWDM. Uh, here's a map, and it's got different colored bullets there. The ones in yellow are, are broadband affiliates of the EMCs, and there's about five or six of those, five of those. Um, most of our EMCs decided to go the partner route. Uh, they're partnering either with a, a local phone company or a local fiber company to uh, provide you know, access to the line. I think the EMCs for most are going to own the fiber, and then they lease that to a third party to do that last uh, drop into the fiber to the home. Um, you know, one of the things that we recognize is how important the reliability is going to be on this. Uh, as many of you on the on the WebEx or in the utility industry, uh, you probably recognize that broadband is becoming just as important as, as the electrical service and that sometimes you get more complaints about broadband being out than your electricity being out. So we know that this has got to be a very, very solid, reliable uh, network, and, and we think the DWDM is going to help us get there. Hey, um, hey David, we had, a, we had a question that came in on this slide, and it was related to backhaul for broadband. And the question, if you're looking at either now or in the future providing backhaul for uh, 5G for any of the mobile operators or players in your state? You know, I, I think that uh, what, we, what we have decided right now is that we're, we're really going to focus on our internal operations and, and the EMCs, and if we have third parties third, or partners that need backhaul, that's really kind of our focus right now. I, I would say if the opportunity was there and um, it, it would help us defray some costs, yeah, we would definitely consider it but we would want to make sure that we handle our primary purpose first. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so I, I put this slide in because uh, this one kind of caught us a little flat. Um, so we knew that, uh, you know, we, we own the distribution substation, so we own the power transformer to the low side of the power transformer, then the EMCs put their equipment in. Uh, so they own their reclosers, regulators, breakers. And so we knew that all the distribution lines coming into the substations, more than likely the EMCs were going to want to put facilities at the substations. We really thought, I, I really thought that uh, they were going to probably want to do that outside the substation. 
but because um, but because the the, the uh, pad is already flat, they didn't have to do any grading. Normally, our stations are big enough you can put take the little corner of the station and put the HUD in. Uh, that that was the main option that most of our members went with. Um, you know, I will say there's some things you need to think about if you're going to do that. Though you got to make sure you have a really good ground to the ground uh, ground connection to the ground grid. Uh, you don't want any step potential. Uh, you don't want to. You got to be careful of access because there are going to be third parties that probably don't have electrical backgrounds going into those little dog pens. Normally, there's not a gate, so they can't get into the energized parts of the station. And then you have to worry a little bit about your oil containment. Uh, you know, most of us are under SPCC kind of oil containment and can't let it get off the pad. So, just some things to think about. And I also say that we got hit with. Uh, multiple requests all at one time because the RDOF grants all came out at one time. So this really hit us over the last two or three months. So uh, we put a lot of focus internally on trying to work with the members on locating where they can put these uh, huts. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, you know, reliable telecom network is essential if you want a reliable electric grid. I mean, it's just like what we were talking about with the the 500 kV substation. We, we depend on electronics and telecom these days to know what's going on in the field, so we got it's got to be reliable. Uh, we feel like you can build a network pretty cost effectively uh, if you if you manage how you build it and and are willing to work with third, other other uh, fiber providers. Um, and then ownership is going to give you options in the future, and you know that's that's something that we really truly appreciate now that we have the EMCs getting into uh, rural broadband. And that's that's my presentation. Sam, okay. turn it over to you. Great. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, Sam, sorry. We had another qu question come in. Maybe you can address this. Um, David had mentioned a couple times um, wavelength division multiplexing in his, in his deployment. And the question was, what's the difference between that and Rotom? Um, actually, can I go ahead and deal with that one? Sure. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I think okay. have you answer that one? Yep. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, a good question. A lot of the uh, more rural operators have not deployed Rodin technology or even DWDM technology. So that's actually a question that, that shows up a lot. Rodin stands for Reconfigurable Optical Add Drop Multiplexer, and it is a type of DWDM or dense wavelength division multiplexing equipment. Uh, the distinguishing characteristic of a Rotom is that it's reconfigurable and automated. So you have a software system and you can uh, provision that Rotom to move wavelengths around in your network however you want to without actually having to visit a site. In earlier generation DWDM equipment, uh, you're kind of moving fibers around by hand and that sort of thing, but Rotom uh, automates that whole process. Thanks, Sam. Hey, Sam, I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry, I wasn't sure. I got interrupted by a Teams call. Forgive me for that, buddy. Um, so let me flip, switch to the next slide. Um, David, thank you for that great presentation. It sounds like it's been very effective. Uh, uh, having that network has been very effective for the things you're trying to do and, and the way you're trying to serve the different EMCs. I have a few slides here that I'll talk about just on selected backhaul technologies that we see a lot of rural operators uh, deploying. And there's really th there's many different technologies. There's three I want to kind of highlight here at the, at the end of our time today. Uh, the first is a low-cost, high-capacity micro-rotum type of equipment. Uh, the second type of uh, thing that's, that's good to have in the toolkit is uh, inexpensive, efficient OTN grooming capabilities. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the third thing we'll talk about is something that, that David referenced was the network OTDR, optical time domain reflectometer, for continuous fiber health monitoring. Uh, lots, lots of big words today. So uh, let's... Uh, dive in and look a little bit at this uh, this concept of a micro-rotom. A rotom, again, is the reconfigurable 
optical add drop mux that allows uh, an operator such as Georgia Transmission to move wavelengths around very easily in an automated fashion. Um, Post-COVID, internet bandwidth needs are high and they're, and they're going to keep growing. So there's a need for a backhaul network to be very scalable in terms of the amount of capacity that, that one can deploy on it. Um, the other way that backhaul networks need to scale is in terms of distance. As you saw from, from David's presentation, you know, bringing traffic back from all those different places in Georgia kind of needs to come back to a couple of locations to access the internet. So there's tremendous distance involved. It's not just, you know, 30 or 40 kilometers anymore. So if you're going to solve a very big bandwidth need and a very big distance need, DWDM, or Dense Wavelength Division Multiplexing Technology, is really the only kind of technology out there uh, that can make this happen. Um, you know, historically, uh, rural operators haven't needed that amount of bandwidth, or they sometimes haven't needed that amount of distance. That's all changing. Uh, fortunately, the technology is changing along with it. And historically, DWDM systems, if they weren't Rotom systems, they're very manually intensive and difficult to own, frankly. But then Rotom systems in the earlier generations were very large, very expensive, and, and really overkill for the application. But recently, there's been a, a lot of advances in technology, and what used to take several cards, as depicted on that picture on the right, can now be shrunk down into a very small piece of hardware. If you can see this, it's roughly, it's a little thicker than this notebook I'm holding, but it's roughly the same size as this, this notebook I'm holding. Uh, used to be a third of a rack or, or, or multiple cards. And, you know, the cost of equipment is, as, uh, as those electronics and photonic uh, components have been integrated and shrunk down, the cost has, has really gone through the floor in a lot of these things. So this is real, this kind of technology is now enabling, in many cases for the first time, rural operators to deploy technologies that maybe a tier one uh, telephone company had been the only folks who could deploy, who could afford that just to, even a few years ago. So we're seeing a tremendous move in that direction and we're working with providers all over the country on deploying these, what one might call micro rotums to solve that kind of problem. The second kind of technology is very interesting is also a technology that has not historically been widely used by, uh, by smaller operators. It's a technology called OTN, and OTN stands for Optical Transport Network, and it's a technology uh, that's a standards-based technology invented by the ITU. Um, historically, OTN switching was deployed by very large telephone companies with very large systems as shown on the right-hand side. They're not literally as tall as a giraffe, but they're big systems, or maybe it's just a small giraffe, um, and those things were very expensive, and they provided a lot of value for the big operators, but just, again, overkill for smaller operators. But fortunately, technology has been changing, and there's a class of technology that's available now that I like to call an OTN networking appliance. It kind of does everything a big switch does, but does it on a much smaller scale. Uh, the good thing about OTN as a technology is it's, um, it's a layer one technology. It carries packet traffic, Ethernet traffic, or IP traffic, but OTN itself is much more like an optical technology. So you can think of it as um, transporting just big pipes. Maybe it could be one gigabit big pipes or 10 gigabit big pipes and larger pipes even than that. And the idea is you can deploy this type of OTN appliance right alongside a Rotom network. The Rotom network will deal with wavelengths. The OTN appliance that's next to the Rotom network, that allows the operator to groom and fill those wavelengths as needed. So you can create one gig pipes, 10 gig pipes, and again, manipulate those pipes in an automated fashion and use them to make very wise use of the wavelength infrastructure. There's also some additional things you can do with protection. The wavelength layer is protected in its own right. You can add additional protection if needed at the OTN layer. You can actually encrypt things at the OTN layer as well. You can encrypt things on the, on, directly on the Rotom system using a transponder, but you can also provide encryption through the OTN, uh, through the OTN device as well. And a lot of people like this type of technology 
because it's not a packet technology, it's a layer one technology, so you can get complete segregation of many different types of traffic. I think in David's network, they're using the Wavelink layer to do this, but you can also use the OTN to segregate operational traffic from internal IT traffic, from internet backhaul traffic that may be riding over the same environment. 50 millisecond protection, and it's very, very simple because it's not a packet device, it's not an Ethernet switch, it's not a router. We can provide you with a router too if you really want one, uh, but the, a lot of people are liking this because it's so simple. There's nothing, there's nothing complicated about it, uh, no control plane, no routing tables, nothing like that. You just point and click and set up these pipes across the OTN layer pretty much however you want to. So that's the second technology I want to highlight, and then the third one is the automated network OTDR that uh, folks like David and others are using to manage the health of their fiber footprint. Um, an OTDR is an optical time domain reflectometer, and historically it was kind of a handheld system. Actually, when I went to college, it wasn't really handheld. It was kind of a luggable thing the size of a suitcase. Now it's kind of handheld and you know, it's you know, roughly this big. And um, what happens is if there's a fiber cut or something like that, uh, a technician would get in a truck and take this handheld device and go out to the field, plug it into the network, and get a trace that's kind of like what's shown here on the upper right-hand side of the slide. There's uh, the OTDR shoots light down the fiber, and if there's any sort of anomaly or perturbation along the fiber, there'll be some light that gets reflected back to that handheld test set, and it produces a trace like you see there. So, And some of those things are, are normal. Uh, the, the, the line slopes down because fiber has loss, of course, and maybe you have a connector or a splice in the fiber, and that's okay too. You have normal connector reflection and loss. But if you have a fiber cut, you see something really squirrely like shown in the, in the drawing there, and you can say, aha, I've got a fiber cut. And that x-axis there is actually the distance along the fiber. So there's no real guesswork about the location of that fiber. And that's how an OTDR works, or the location of that cut. So that's how an OTDR works. A network OTDR kind of takes that to the next level. Instead of a handheld device hauled around by somebody in a truck, it just takes a lot of time and it's complicated. The network OTDR is actually embedded inside the network and it's software controlled and it automatically scans for failures uh, potentially across every fiber in your footprint. And it just does that for you in real time. You don't have to call somebody, you don't have to run a test set into the field. And it can automatically locate those fiber failures to within meters. And you can deploy this network OTDR solution actually in service because the, the light that is shot by that OTDR is at a slightly different wavelength than your traffic carrying light. And you can deploy that in service really alongside any network. It doesn't have to. If you've got, if you've got a network out there and it doesn't use ribbon equipment, you can put this network OTDR right alongside that other equipment. It will work just fine. We have lots of customers right now who are doing just that. And, you know, finding failures uh, rapidly is important. And especially, you know, sometimes the failure just happens inside your facility because somebody moved the wrong jumper. You don't want to dispatch a truck for that. You want to find that easily. So you can find the indoor failures very quickly. You can isolate failures to the correct network. Um, many of our customers, uh, have you know, partnerships and fiber swapping deals, much like David described, where there's also maintenance agreements. So maybe a section of fiber, that operator is responsible to, for maintenance on that, but maybe a different section of fiber, maybe somebody else, another entity is responsible for maintenance. So this way you can isolate the failure to the correct portion of the network and easily identify who's responsible to go fix it. That's a big deal for a lot of our customers. Eliminates the truck roll, and it also finds degradations before failures actually occur. So what happens, because these fibers are being characterized in real time all the time, the software system that runs this can collect essentially that trace data, and you kind of get a baseline. You basically get a, a birth certificate, if you will, on the health of your own fiber. And then if something is starting to degrade, there'll be warnings and alerts you know, far before the traffic is impacted, just say, hey, there's something squirrely going on with this fiber span. You might want to go take a look at it, and here's exactly where that squirrely thing is, is happening. So a lot of our customers see a lot of benefits in doing this. It saves a lot of money. 
in, uh, in troubleshooting and managing the, uh, the health of their buffer. So in conclusion, I think we got a few more questions I see, you can see coming in. Um, the time is really right for rural operators to get into the broadband game. Uh, the tremendous need, tremendous enablers, both on the regulatory side and on the technology side. So to deliver that great internet service to those rural customers, you don't just need an access network, you actually need a great backhaul network to go along with that. And electric utilities are very well positioned to, uh, to make use and provide backhaul services. We saw in great detail, again, thank you so much, David, how Georgia Transmission was able to really reduce their, their internal operational costs. You're really able to increase the bandwidth on that network and provide a very valuable service uh, to the EMCs in Georgia and to the, therefore, to the residents in the, in the state of Georgia. And then finally, we touched on a few key technologies, Rotom, OTN, and OTDR technologies really make that easier for operators than it has ever been, and that's not an exaggeration. So with that, um, we have a little time for uh, questions and answers. Jamie, do we have some more questions? We do, and we actually, I think one probably be addressed towards um, David, even though it was on your slide, when you were talking about the uh, traffic separation. Um, you know, the question is to, I guess, is Georgia Transmission concerned around um, the security threats or issues by using the same fibers for internal and commercial traffic? I will say that was a big uh, concern for us initially. Uh, I think we got comfortable with the fact that, like I said, different colors of light are actually a physical separation. So we, we don't intermingle uh, traffic, uh, internet traffic, onto the light waves that we're using for operational traffic. We try to keep those very separate. So th at, there's probably a much better answer than that, but that's, that's kind of what we've done is just the uh, using the physical separation of the color. Okay, thanks. And, and Sam, then on your last slide when you're talking about OTDR, um, the question was, on that slide it showed a map. Um, can, can the OTDR solution actually predict where the cut is on a map? Do you integrate with GIS systems, or, or what is that? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Jamie. Yeah, the, the trace is on the upper right is typically what an OTDR produces, uh, but there's software available in our solution that, you know, it doesn't, just the trace itself doesn't do you a whole lot of good. You actually need, because, you know, fiber doesn't run in a straight line, so you actually need to kind of go and, and understand where that fiber cut is in the real world. So there is an ability then to correlate that trace data with, uh, with the GIS map. So that, that, that capability is, uh, is available. Okay. I think we've answered them. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I missed one from the beginning. So, uh, David, I think this would be towards you. So, when when we were talking about your presentation, um, I think this is reliability of the fiber plant. And the question is, what's the main factor in the dramatic reliability of the fiber plant that you were showing? Um, I, well, I, I, I know getting away from copper is always better. Uh, we, you know. I think it's a lot of it is it's newer equipment. Uh, the fiber, obviously, I think is a cleaner medium. But, you know, I think a lot of our problems with lease circuits are really uh, the local phone companies, they don't keep the batteries up in their slicks. Uh, that's, that's a huge one. Uh, we'll have a power outage, and the batteries don't kick in or they're dead, and then we lose communications to everything. So I, I think it's really just it's, it's a better medium, and it's, the, the equipment's newer, we're just having a lot less problems with it. And, uh, I, you know, hopefully by being tied into fiber, you know, a lot of the problems we, we originally had in telecommunications were the spikes inside the substation would fry the equipment. So we would put, uh, you know, a lot of protection on them. But so being in a, being in a very adverse environment in a substation, but being with fiber, I think, is an, uh, has been a big help for us. And I think that's what's uh, in, improved the uh, reliability as well. So I think that's all the questions. I think everything has been addressed. I know the question around the slides was addressed, I think, written. So, yep, we'll get, get those sent out. 
So I, I, I will say, yeah, I will say that, that you know my uh, email address is up there on the screen. If if anybody wants to have any further discussions or uh, you know, I'll get the smart people from my organization into the meeting, and, and we can kind of talk. But uh, feel free to reach out. No, that's terrific. And uh, and uh, reach out to any of us here at uh, at Ribbon as well. Myself, uh, Cal Kalenda, and Elizabeth Page are all listed there. And uh, uh, Cal and Elizabeth have a, a lots of experience in helping customers with uh, different types of networks, kind of in this in this category. So with that, Lance, uh, shall I throw it back to you? Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, David. And, and thanks, Jamie, for handling some of those questions. And uh, to everybody for attending today, as Sam just mentioned, you can see all the contact information right there on your screen. So please reach out if you come up with some other questions that uh, you have from the material today. Uh, we will be sending out an email later this afternoon. That email will have a link to the replay of, of today's webinar. Uh, as well as a copy of the slides. So look for that in your inbox. Um, feel free to also reply to that email if you have a question. Um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get back to you quickly. And uh, again, we just appreciate your time today, uh, and we hope to see you on the next webinar that we have. So just stay tuned to uh, emails and the Ribbon Communications uh, website, as well as uh, gatrans.com for any additional information you may need on this topic. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your week. Take care.